I will start then. Hello, everyone, and thank you so, so much for joining tonight. Um, my name is Izzy Kirkby, and I support the Association of Master Herbalists with their CPD program. And I'm really, really, really excited to actually have Andrew Mason, who is a council member for the Association of Master Herbalists. But not only that, he's incredibly talented. I've been in awe of his work for years. He does alchemy. He does uh, astrology, but also is an incredible iridologist, which he's been studying for over 20 years and is the leading behavioral iridologist in the UK. So um, I'm really, really grateful that Andrew has um, come to do a talk for us tonight, basically explaining, um, but, well, iridology in general, but also how you can use iridology in practice as a health practitioner. Um, and if you are really interested in this, and I'm sure you all will be because there's so much, of, he, Andrew's got slides and everything, so we'll be learning lots of stuff that we can take away straight away but if you do want to learn more then um andrew is also doing an in-depth introduction so sort of foundational course in behavioral iridology, iridology sorry which i'll be um sending the link to if anyone wants to join that uh, which starts on wednesday and he will be offering everyone that joins uh, a really good discount actually it's already super super cheap but everyone that signs up will get a 10 percent discount so i'll send you the links and coupon codes if you are interested in that but even if you're not um i will hand over to andrew because he's got so much information to share tonight um and if you have questions just pop them in the chat um and we'll get we'll leave time for q a afterwards um and i think that covers everything for now so um i will hand over to Andrew. So thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. Thank you, Izzy. Thank you, everyone, for coming along. Um, I'll try and whistle through this fairly quickly if I can. There's quite a lot to uh, to show. I think basically I'll just start very quickly with um, my background or how I got interested in this. Um, I actually discovered a, a very small paperback in a uh, bookshop in the middle of nowhere uh, years and years ago. This is like mid-90s, and it was a small book on iridology and uh, I didn't know anything about it I had no prior interest and I just picked it up it was very very cheap so a second-hand bookshop had a read of it and got quite interested in it and um, from there I was able to find sort of more advanced work read that get more into it you know like you do you sort of you sort of uh, stepping stone from one thing to the next and then um, I was talking to a homeopathic a uh, friend of mine, actually, and um, I mentioned this book and he said, oh, you know, there's amazing things you can tell from the eye. It's not just about health. You can tell personality. And I thought, oh, that sounds even more amazing. So long to cut a long story short, it eventually led me to what was at that time, uh, end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s. I think that the, the early version of this, if you like, was the Ray method, which is still going. I mean, it's still taught in some in some semblance, but uh, I got to know one of the Red masters really well. And he kind of broke away from the organization. His name was Jim Burgess, and he broke away from that organization. And we kind of went, went on together to develop behavioral iridology. So we took elements of the work that he'd been doing, some of the work I'd been doing, and of course, you know, some foundational work from Red, and then that kind of birthed the behavioral system. So that's that's kind of where I came from and uh, my kind of background or interest in it. What I liked about this system over, I mean, it's not that I, you, you can't say one's better than the other. You have a kind of a physical model, which is looking more at health and behavioral, which is looking more at the behavioral side of things. But what I liked about the behavioral model was everything that uh, I was showing before in the physical model, which was actually could be a bit detrimental or a bit worrying. Or if you see some sign in the eye, you get nervous about it. If you see any kind of structure, you think, oh my God, what does that mean? that kind of gets turned on its head in this model because basically everything in the eye is there ha has uh, beneficial uh, qualities. It's good for you. You know, it's there to, to change your life. It's there to uh, enable you to overcome things, to, to sort of, uh, you know, fight back challenges and all that kind of thing. So it sort of turned that whole physical model on its head. So that's not to say that, you know, um, it's not to say that, uh, one is better than the other. They're just different approaches uh, to the iris. And, you know, we, as we'll see in a minute, I'll show you how you can use, I think what we do is we'll spend the, the first uh, third, if you like, just going over the system, because obviously I know a lot of you will be iridologists, but you may not all be iridologists. So let me just go a little bit over how the system works and, you know, what we're looking at. And then as we move forward, we'll look at a little bit more in-depth material. And then towards the end, we'll go into how that could actually benefit you to know 
uh, you know, on a constitutional level, what type of person you have in front of you. So without further ado, let me just share my screen. Um, yeah, make sure I do this right, Izzy. Shout if I get it wrong, yeah? Can you see that? Yes, we can. Good. Look at that. Okay, so what is iridology? So obviously a lot of... Do you want to make it full screen? Oh, I do. I do. <laughs> well, good point, good point. Let's just make sure. Make sure it actually changes. Um, make sure it changes slide when I tab forward. I don't want to leave everyone behind. Oops. Okay. So... What is iridology? So as you can see there, we've got a nice uh, nice iris to look at there. Um, that's basically what we're looking at. We're looking at the colored part of the eye. Now, in this, uh, in the behavioral model and in the physical model, we do sort of pay some, uh, you know, we'll, we'll study the, the whole iris as well. It's not just the iris, but primarily we're interested in the, in the colored portion of the eye. So there you go. So we've got the pupil there. We've got this collarette around the outside. There's the actual iris edge, and then obviously the white of the eye. But this is the coloured portion is that we're looking at. That's the main. That's our main focus in the system. Okay. So iridology, uh, in the form that we recognise today, obviously there are references that say that people will. I mean, if uh, for instance, there's an Indian text that I've got um, that I quite often show people. It's written probably 400. 400 BC, maybe a little bit later, but it talks about how to how to determine different things of, uh, about the body by looking in the eye. So you could make an, a tentative argument. It's a sort of iridology, although they weren't specifically looking at the iris. They were looking at the whole eye. But let's just say in the form that we recognize today, it's been around for about 170 years. OK, so we might term this the physical model because it's analyzing the physical conditions of the body and it's based on a, on a sort of different constitutional types. The behavioral model, as I'd said, it's been around for about 40 years, so it's a much newer system. Um, but this system still uses the iris to understand, you know, to, to, we're looking at exactly the same thing, but we're determining personality traits from that eye as well. And of course, we don't throw the, the physical side out. We're still considering all that. It's a kind of another layer of the work. But primarily, this is uh, we're looking at the sort of the mind over the body rather than the body over the mind, if you know what I mean. Okay. So let's just quickly look at the physical model. So the physical model uses a uh, constitution based on color. So the physical model of iridology uses a constitutional model based upon iris color. These are blue mixed. This is very basic stuff, but very basically blue, uh, a mixed color or brown. So the idea is here, somebody walks in, you determine the iris color. And then from there, you'll let's say you could say bluish, then we'll assign a kind of more lymph uh, you know, reactive uh, immune system, or if it's a brown iris, it's going to be more brown, uh, more blood, and more circulatory, and then everything else that falls in between those two. Because blue isn't really; it's not a color per se; it's just an effect. But we we categorize it as a blue mixed and brown. So anything that falls in between the blue and the brown, we'll call like a bile, and it's going to be more like a digestive thing. I mean, that's the that's a very simple, simplistic overview of how the physical model will determine or, uh, you know, kind of um, categorize a person by their iris color. But it goes further than that. So the physical model also makes use of iris maps. So the idea of this is that you simply overlay these maps over the top of the iris. And from that, you can then correlate structure in the iris to, to structure in the body, body. Now, I've just picked four random iris maps here. There are many, many iris maps there. Are, I mean, to be on the, to be, uh, to be honest, most of them are pretty much the same. Um, there'll be a few variations. And obviously, you know, practitioners like to take pride in the fact that it's their map and they've sort of discovered a little bit something extra that somebody else missed. So there's going to be a few variations in them. But on the whole, uh, this is kind of more or less what you're going to get. You see some are quite simplistic. They're more about boxes and zones. Some are kind of, they don't have any demarcation they're kind of just floating names others are kind of very regimented some are highly detailed but that's basically the idea here that's this is you know they're mapping the body by you've got your, obviously uh, your left and your right iris you're putting your map over the top and you're looking for structure that's corresponding to areas on these maps and then that in theory should reflex those parts of the body okay so that in a very brief nutshell is the physical model and how it works or the the, the theory behind it OK, the behavioral model is a little bit different. What we're really looking at or what we're interested in is different types of structure in the iris. 
Um, so what we're looking for is the regularity of the fiber, the compact quality of the fiber. You know, is it the, the fibers that make up the eye? Are they very compact, close together? Or are they very open, weavy, loose? You know, like you get a real sense of looseness. Or like they're, they're like, there's a transparency there. Particularly when we see big openings in the fiber, that's a big one for us as well. If we see these big opening areas, these are called lacuna in uh, iridology, but it just means like a pool or an opening or a space. And the last thing is these acquired pigments in the iris. These uh, uh, they used to be called sorex spots. I still call them sorex spots, and I get I get slapped on the wrist for calling them that. But um, you can say pigment patches and stuff like that. Uh, don't worry about actually identifying these. We'll look at some photos in a bit, and then you can actually see see what I'm fully what I'm talking about. But just know that in the behavioural model, we're more interested in structure than we're interested in iris colour. Okay. Uh, or I should say that color isn't completely irrelevant in the behavioral model, but it plays a smaller part. It, it's more like a modifier. It's it, we would add it as a sort of a like icing on the cake. It's just a, it would give us a, a little bit of extra information. OK, so as I said, there's three constitutional types in the physical model. We only work with two constitutional types in the behavioral model. So there you go. That's even easier to learn. You, you, you only have to learn two instead of three. So <laughs> that's a benefit already. Um, and what we're doing is we're categorizing uh, people into two, into two basic constitutions. We have an emotional feeling and we have a thinking analytical. OK, so this on the left is a good example of an emotional feeling type. What we're looking for, think about it, emotions are kind of unpredictable movement, energy changing, you know, like it's dynamic, isn't it? So already you can see, look at the dynamic quality of this iris on the left. It's like lots of openings. It's wavy. Everything's flowing. And we've got these big pockets, these big openings or big uh, partings of the fiber. So you could think about these as like pockets of energy. They hold pockets of energy. They're like an empty space that's holding something. OK. And the counter side to that or the balancing constitution is the thinking analytical type. And this is a much more introverted, controlled, structural, holding together energy. It's like it's kind of the opposite. It's tight, regimented, and the energy is moving in and condensing. OK, so what makes this a thinking type is the fact that there's lots of these colored spots in the eye. So we know that's indicating a thinking type. And if we have the open weave uh, and the uh, open petals or these open lacunas, that's our emotional type. Now, it gets... It's not as simple as that, but that's a sort of a very simple level of how we're how we're assessing. And that this is becomes prime the primary thing in the behavioral system is determining which side you're falling on. Are you some kind of uh, emotional type? Are you some kind of thinking type? And so those are the kind of primary indicators. But I hear you cry, ha ha, you say, well, what happens if there's no, if there's just fiber in there and there's none of these openings and there's no colored spots? Well, then we can still determine if it's a thinking or a, uh, emotional type by the fact of how compact are the fibers. So if we were devoid of these openings and devoid of these color pigments, which I have to say is pretty unlikely, but in the event that we did see that, and they are, there are some out like that, um, if they're very loose, if there's still a looseness to the fiber, we know that it's an emotional type. And if there's a compact quality to the fiber, we know it's a thinking type. So we could say, looking at these very quickly, I can see quite clearly that this is an emotional type because there are lots of openings and pockets. And on top of that, we have lots of loose, wavy, open fiber. So that's like a double whammy. We've got our openings and we've got loose fiber. And conversely, on this side, you can see we've got lots and lots of pigment patches or these sora everywhere, and the fiber is very tight and regimented. So that's another, that's a double whammy the other way. It's a thinking type because it's got spots, but also the iris fiber is very tight and compact. Okay, so that's, that's our two constitutions that we're working with. Okay, so people might say, well, hang on a minute. What about these brown eyed types? You get a type like this walk into your office and you're trying to think, yikes, which, where are we going with this? Is this, a, <laughs> is this thinking or is this emotional? Well, the good news is with the advent of uh, you know, digital photography and uh, editing software, we can, actually, we can actually see. I mean, we can kind of, we can't remove the color, but we can, we can work with images like this and lighten them up. So although we look at this and just essentially we're looking at two brown discs, if I hit the magic button and lighten it, there we go. So that's just literally applied a lightning or what they call a dodge filter. So just brighten up the fibers. I can see it actually, there's quite a lot of these openings. There's a lot of these lacuna in here. Now, some are very close to this 
they're very close to the pupil, but we'll still count them because we can see the looseness. You see how I've just by lightening that we've got, um, maybe it's not so clear on your screen, but it's quite, I can, I can see clearly that this is a, uh, uh, this is an emotional type. Okay. So just know that with very dark brown eyes, with the advent of digital photography, at least you're going to be able to work with that as well. But you quite, you quite often find if you side light an eye, or if you've got like the old, you know, the old magnifier and the, the loop, if you sort of get in there closely, you can still determine. Okay, so it's not it's not that we have to write off brown eyes. And there are other trick tip, tips and tricks we can use to identify as well, but we, we won't go into that here. That's uh, that's something I've will say for well, I've say for the course. Okay, so um, and we also have our own iris map as well, just like the uh, physical system. We also have an iris map. Only this time uh, we're correlating personality traits uh, instead of the uh, instead of the physical traits that we use in the physical map. So we're looking at personality traits, emotions, and very interestingly, <coughs> um, ancestral influences. This is because we primarily read the left eye as the mother and the mother's family and that mother's lineage and the right eye is the father and the father's lineage. So there's a there's an ancestral component in that as well. And it all gets, once we get into this inner area, once we move into this, the final third of the iris close to the pupil or into the, the, the intuitive zone, the sort of subconscious area, this is all like heavily influenced by uh, ancestral family influences as well. So we look to here to be, this is a sort of specifically connected with that ancestral influence. So lots and lots of things uh, to look at. And again, you know, we there is a physical map that I use that correlates with this map. So again, you can still look at the iris positions to see how they, uh, how the physical and the behavioral kind of layer on top of each other. So for instance, you know, like the heart area is the same as the physical. So heart and heart voice is like the kind of, um, you've got that thyroid area. Uh, anger is like the liver gallbladder. So you, there's a crossover as well between you can even look at the organs and then the energetic between or behind organs, you know, thinking like um, what's the classic ones like lungs, like grief, isn't it? And pancreas, jealousy and uh, anger, the liver. So all those things cross over as well. There's lots and lots of richness and we've got a lot of material we can draw on as well. So layering the two systems, that's why I say we don't throw physical out and just say, oh, we won't use it at all. It's there as a sort of a, a shadow or something that ghosts behind the emotional, and we can still fall back on that as well for, for extra information. Okay, so this is going to be way, this is way more than we'll go into tonight. But what this, what I've done here is I, this is a, a the map, if you like, or the kind of the tool that we use to dissect. So it's a layered, it's a series of concentric rings. So the idea here is that the behavioral model is best represented by a series of concentric rings. So as you move towards the center of the diagram, uh, Irish structure is interpreted more specifically. So uh, the sort of constitutional, you know, determining thinking or feeling is the, the outer ring and they're the biggest parts of the map. You can see, you know, this whole side is dedicated to emotional, this whole side to thinking. So that's the kind of primary thing we need to determine. Is it some kind of thinking person or is it some, some kind of emotional person? And then we can start adding in our effects. I won't go into the effects today. It's, it's, it's too... Um, it's too much. We haven't got our time to do that. But then we can determine effects. This is uh, you could think of the the driver effect as going faster, and the empathic effect as going slower. So that's like you know how we know that they're. Uh, for instance, we could say we know that they're a feeling emotional type, but have they got their foot on the pedal and they're accelerating, or have they got have they got their foot on the brake and they're slowing down? That's that's what those two effects tell us. And then inside of that ring, we've got our social types. We can determine there are four sort of social types that make up society, you know, where, like what careers would suit them or what kind of inter social interactions they do better in, those kind of things. And then finally, we're into our modifiers, things like iris color, what difference is that going to make to the personality, the expression ring. This, this is a, another ring that we look at in the eye that's close to the pupil that uh, tells us if they're kind of more, more outward and expressive or they're more introverted and holding back. Then there are many other types of iris ring that we look at. We have six rings, three on each side that balance each other. So energetically, they modify the personality as well, kind of speed up, make more dynamic, slow down, make more constricted. They're all kind of like modifiers. And then finally, we've got individual iris positions because, of course, every eye is going to be different. And you might have structure where no one else has got it or structure in certain parts of the eye mean different things. That's why we would get more specific 
as we move in through those rings. So you can see in terms of a model between the physical and the behavioral, there's a lot of similarity. They, they both have a constitutional model. They both use maps. Uh, the behavioral is obviously looking at behavioral and uh, the physical. And then, but the physical, in some respects, people might say, okay, so they're looking at a lever position in the physical modeling, still might relate that back to anger or something. So there's a little bit of crossover between the two systems. Okay, so um, let's just go back to these primary types. The two primary constitutions are universal. So everyone, everyone here tonight will fall on one side of the spectrum. You're either going to be some type of emotional feeling or you're going to be a thinking analytical type. Okay. Now, um, there are many eyes out there and, you know, determining that is not always easy. On the whole, it's fairly easy. I would say in 50% of the cases, it's going to be quite obvious what constitution they are. 25% of the time, it's going to take a little bit more thought. And then you're going to get those last sort of 25% where you're going to need the skill set to, to sort of take it apart because two things could be happening. There could just be irises that are devoid of lots of structure. So like we gave that example earlier of, you know, if we had no colored patches and we had no openings, how could we determine constitution? Well, then we're going back to the quality of the, um, the iris fiber. So that's when you'd have to know on a scale, you know, is this loose or is this compact? You know, there's a sort of a scale that you would learn that would help you determine. Or you can just reach a point where let's say you've got the, an equal amount of, um, uh, of lacuna or these openings and an equal amount of sorus. So how do you decide which side they're going to fall on? So again, that's where we would, we have a counting technique, which sort of works out which side of the fence they're going to fall on. And then of course we can still look at the iris fiber in the background to see whether that's pushing it one way or the other. So lots and lots of uh, little tips and tricks. And I mean, but like I said, you know, on the, for the most part, you're going to be able to determine. I don't think it's going to be uh, that difficult. Okay, so we've done the two, two primary constitutions. So let's have a look at some of the qualities of these and um, let's see uh, let's see what's coming up. So what I've done is I've given some qualities, uh, the sort of long-term life lessons of the structure, their fears, signs of imbalance, and then their kind of gifts or, you know, things that they bring to the table, you know, they're, they're, they're the sort of gifts that they're bearing, if you like. So qualities wise, generally, remember, we're talking generally here, every eye is specific, but if we take the emotional type as a general, more extroverted, outgoing, spontaneous, imaginative, creative, um, highly developed auditory intake, very visually expressive. So like to listen to things and the eyes kind of shut down more but they are animated. There's lots of movement. They attract, you know, they're like the sort of something like that that, that cre creates attention in the room. But it's almost like the auditory is going out. The eyes are sort of like shutting down, but they're kind of waving around. They're getting everybody else's attention. So you can imagine that all that energy that's pouring into that iris, it's filling all the, I mean, the energy is kind of pouring out of the pupil, radiating across the iris, and it's all getting collected in these little pockets. And they're all filling up with all this, welling up with all this energy, explosive energy, and they want to, uh, you know, get excited and they're imaginative and creative. So um, it tends to dissipate very quick. There's a, there's a high energy loss. It's like high energy use, but high energy loss. So the long-term life lesson, uh, lo the long-term life lesson, sorry, uh, anything that slows down and organizes and focuses that. And you'll, so you'll see when we look at its opposite constitution, they'll all be the opposite. So the opposite constitution is the balancing factor. Okay. So let's just stick with the emotional at the moment. So when they plan, get clear about things, take responsibility, act with certainty and patience is a big one as well. Not wanting, you know, just like not, foot to the floor and going at a full belt and just taking it all as it comes when they kind of meter a more methodical balance than all of these things that we've talked about this kind of imagination creativity these all explode and go through the roof because they've got a constant source of energy they're not depleting all the time okay so the fears of this type well if you think all that energy just leaving it's just like the blasting out pocketing expanding and then just being lost so the fears being alone, feeling abandoned, being left behind, lost, you know, we're losing everything, running out, you know, running out of 
food, running out of energy, running, it's all just being left and forgotten. And when that happens, the imbalanced quality of this, what roars back into that empty space is emptiness. And then they get sort of, uh, you know, feeling depressed, feeling alone, sad, become angry, blaming, you know, it's, it's all everybody else's fault. It's not my fault. They left me, you know, it's all, all kind of abandoned. So those are the kind of signs. If you get a, uh, an emotional type and they're coming in, there's a lot of blame, there's a lot of anger, feeling kind of very needy or depressed, like depression's a big one. So you can sort of say, okay, this, this constitution is in a state of imbalance. There's been too much energy loss. It's not being revitalized. The, the spaces aren't being refilled in the iris. So the gifts that they bring, so this is their great benefit, creativity, spontaneity, imagination, and connecting everybody, bringing everybody together, connecting ideas, creating things that, you know, that everybody can enjoy. And spontaneity, isn't it? Breaking the deadlock, you know, that they are the sort of the, the, the random uh, connection that suddenly comes up with a new idea and sends everybody in a new direction. So it keeps things spontaneous and creative. Um, OK, so let's look at the opposite. So quite easy to remember these constitutions because this whole system is based on a system of balance. Right. So whatever is good for one. Uh, is going to be um, is going to be they're going to be drawing from their opposite all the time. So you know it's all ba it's based on this sort of uh, left and right polarity all the time. So generally thinking type we see it's thinking type because we've got the coloured spots in there again. Much more introverted. This is an analytical, detail orientated type. Okay, verbally expressive likes to talk a lot. Uh, very precise. Lots of organisation, clarity, forward planning. Highly developed visual intake, um, but love being vocally expressive. So watching what everybody's doing, studying everything, and then be able to express that in words, being very clear, you know, focusing, making sure everybody's doing what being told to do the right things is kind of directing everybody, you know, and they've got that good. It's very, very quick, you know, kind of watching with the eye. It's all very, the patter's all down, and then they just literally can explain it very clearly and, all, you know, just natural um, orators, stuff like that. So life lessons. Uh, so it's the opposite. They are learning. They're, 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 they're too constrictive. It's too, there's too much energy going in. There's too much containment. So they're looking for more like spontaneity, openness, allowing and flowing. When they let go, when they act more like their opposite or integrate more of the opposite into their life. You know, they give themselves that space to to let go, to relax. I mean, this is a this is a structure that's just building too much all the time. So if they can relax, let go, and their energy can flow, and then they actually get more clear and uh, the greater clarity. But there's not that urgency, that sort of like hurried feeling all the time to sort of try and get everything that's going, just understand everything instantaneously. So the big fears of this type: critis uh, being criticised. Uh, judged or to be shown in error. Obviously, they like to get everything right, like to get all the ducks in a row, get all their information right. So it's really sort of goes to the heart if you tell them they got something wrong. You know, this is like, it's, it's quite cutting, okay? So when they become imbalanced, it becomes very controlling, opinionated, uh, critical, interruptive, or basically they just walk out of the room and vanish or not deal with it or just walk away from it. They go away, lick their wounds, reread all the books, make sure they've got everything right and then come back with a better argument. Okay. So they're not going to hang around and just sort of take it. They're going to, you know, just let, just leave the room and uh, just trying to, uh, you know, just trying to channel all their energy into really understanding something even more clearly. So the gifts are um, wisdom, uh, they can gain that kind of inner stillness, conscientiousness, great clarity. You know, they can be great thinkers if they just give them spell, gives themselves some room or the space to, um, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with error. We learn from our mistakes. But I mean, for obviously for a thinking type to make mistakes is a pretty terrible thing. So, um, you know, if they can give themselves that space, they come back and they'll be even sharper. You know, they can sharpen that intellect even, even more strongly. So they are like two sides of the same coin. You know, what balances... Uh, you know, is going to whatever benefits is going to help its opposite. You know, you need them to um, you need them to balance each other. And it goes even deeper than that because their energetics are highly attractive to one another. So even in relationship dynamics, quite opposite, uh, quite often you'll attract your opposite type. So if you are a thinking analytical type, you're going to be more prone to or you will be more prone to attract the 
uh, emotional uh, feeling type and vice versa. Now there are, again, little, there's always caveats to these things, but that's the general. So generally, you know, the, the, the polarity is set that we attract our opposite. So even in our relationship, we're attracting things into our life that are helping to balance us, okay? Uh, let's look at some health profiles now. This is probably going to be more interesting for people that are actually wanting to use a system in a health capacity. So let's look. What we'll do first of all is we'll look at um, the kind of inherent things that we'd expect with these structures and then how that would play out in an interaction if you're actually dealing with these two different constitutions. So first of all, let's look at structural weaknesses. So if you think about the structure in the emotional feeling type it's kind of all open spaces isn't it it's like openness hollow spaces emptiness wiggliness waviness it's that kind of you know uh transparency like there's something there but it's a bit indefinable so generally it's the hollow organs of the body where the energy also collects as well so um let's say from some for instance like stomach bladder colon they're typical because sort of hollow organs they're holding they're like a holding space a bit like these open spaces in the iris and this is where that charge collect so quite often we say that the hollow organs are the organs that we associate mostly with this type of uh, this type of constitution okay now it's a little bit more involved in that because hollow and solid organs are from so even from a Chinese perspective have lots of little caveats as well like the heart you could say is like it has the open you know it has the four chambers but then there's a musculature to it so it has a little bit of both and also for the emotional type, we kind of assign more energy to the heart. And for the thinking type, it's more to the brain, obviously, because brain thinking, heart, emotions. But, you know, outside of that, there's a there's a little bit of playing around with that hollow and solid. But just try and think about the, the nature of the organ, its sort of compact quality or its spaciousness. OK, we would also look at the hollowness of the, say, the hollowness of the bones, connective tissue in the body, any kind of cavities, nasal cavities, uh, uh, the ear, ear canal, cavities and spaces, the circulatory system, anything that's in motion. Remember these fibers, this kind of waviness, like the Mexican wave where this energy is like passing through them. So anything that's transporting or communication, uh, it's sort of a communication system in the body um, is, is more inclined towards this structure. Uh, points of articulation joints are a big one, uh, particularly inflammation usually because this is always in, in motion and moving. So those joints tend to get a bit of a pounding, particularly the knees, actually, with this, uh, with this particular structure as well. And I've just put there at the bottom, the more lacuna, the more symptomatic. Obviously, the more of these we see in the eye, then the more it's moving towards that. So, you know, as far as the structural weakness goes, this would be a prime candidate for all of these by virtue of the fact there is so much uh, so many open spaces in this eye and the fibers quite loose as well. So again, it's that sort of double whammy. We've got open fibers and loose iris fibers as well. Okay. Let's look at the health profile of the thinking type. Uh, so again, the opposite. So it's more the solid organs for this type. Um, this is, uh, we've got liver, spleen, pancreas. Again, we said about the brain, but it's kind of more, this is more like the digestive type as well. So you can think about organs of assimilation. As well, I think I've mentioned that. There you go. So the assimilation digestion system, because it's kind of like if you think about what the mind does, isn't it? We're kind of analyzing and digesting. It's that quality. It's like uh, breaking things down into their component parts and then assimilating them as well. So anything that has that quality in the body. OK, so the muscle dense tissue of the body, anywhere that, where there's density. Remember, this, this structure is moving towards kind of con contraction and, and density all the time. Uh, central nervous system itself, uh, not so much the, the communication that's moving on the central nervous system, but the actual structure of the central nervous system. Um, and things like the absorption of minerals and things like that, minerals, uh, trace minerals and metals, those kind of things. Um, again, as I said before, the more sore, the more symptomatic. So this has got quite a lot of sore in this iris. So this would be a pretty good candidate for these. This is the way you'd be sort of thinking about it. Um, you know, that would be, a, 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 and again, it's quite dense fiber on this. So again, that double whammy, we've got dense fiber and we've got colored spots. So again, this would be more something we'd be looking at that would kind of intensify a bit that uh, the way we'd be assessing the person. 
Um, okay, so the next thing we can look at is like resistance as well, just the overall. So aside from thinking about colored spots and openings, just the general structure of the eye, how much, uh, how much density have we got there? Is it a low resistance type or is it a high resistance type? So there we go. There's four grades of iris fiber starting from this one, which is quite loose. That's a little bit more dense, but still got lots of openings. That's quite compact, but a few loose fibers here. And then that's that's pretty dense, that one there. OK, so the more dense and regimented the iris fiber, the more resistance and resilience is shown by the body tissues. The greater the separation looseness of iris fiber, the less resistance and resilience shown by the bodily tissues. So that's another thing we could work with as well. And also, generally, if you think about um, the looser it is, the, the faster it's more emotional energy is dissipating faster, whereas the more it's, it's dense, it's trapping, it's uh, holding things. So this is kind of like those sieves. You know, think about the sieve where you, you're filtering things. If it's kind of coarse material, a lot of it can move through quite quickly. It's not going to block the sieve. So it can pass a lot of information through quickly, but it's not going to necessarily hold it. Whereas this is this kind of sieve is very, very fine. It's going to trap everything. It's going to get overloaded. It's going to take a long time for it to process. That's why it's kind of slowing down the assimilation. OK, so that's quite a big one. We'll look at a resistance, you know, and, and even... I tend to equate resistance in an eye to how quickly you can deal with people as well, how quickly a therapy or something can be done. You know, it, it, it may be that they're high resistance, so they can take a lot of intense therapy, whereas if it's more sensitive or more open, you're going to have to do it more slowly. You're going to have to work with them slowly. They're going to want to go quicker because by virtue of the fact the fibers are open, they, they want to move faster. But generally this one has to be more paced. It's, you know, it's... Uh, being regimented is the key to success, okay? Uh, so the two constitutional types in summary. So just again, remember this is just a general, these are the sort of things that we look, we'd look at. Uh, if so, somebody's coming in and you're dealing with them for the first time, regardless of whatever therapy you're doing, you could be doing body work, homeopathy, Ayurveda, Chinese or whatever. Remember you're using this as a constitutional typing. So it's almost, working out what type of person has got the disease rather than what disease the person's got, if you know what I mean. Um, so when we're looking, we're just thinking, right, what, what are the kind of traits that are associated with this constitution and how would it be best to work with them? So uh, the emotional thinking type, the more wavy, the more loose the fibers, the more openings, it's going to be much more agitated and restless, it's more sensitive to others, more sensitive to the environment around them. Seeking instant results, like really fast, they want quick results and they'll lose interest quickly as well. Remember, energy is coming in and passing out quickly. So it's hitting that fine line between um, showing that they're going to get benefit from it, but at the same time, keeping the treatment interesting or keeping them focused on it and not to lose interest on it. And remember that they like to be seen as well. You know, they, it's important that you're acknowledging them that they're there. Remember this type is like, there's that sort of fear of abandonment or people just like passing them off or letting them go or not interested. So, you know, taking an interest in their case, it's, it's not even like you have to take huge amounts of detailed notes. The fact that they're just being seen as a big grounding force for them. Uh, reacting to the tone of your words. So it may not be that you, how, it's not so much what you're saying, it's how you're saying it. So you have to kind of be mindful about um, how you're speaking. You know, you, you have to kind of be more, maybe a more upbeat or you, it, to you, it just might be a normal way of expressing. But remember that the tone is what they're kind of tuning in on. Remember, they're the auditory type. So they're really focusing not so much on the content of your words, but the way that you're saying it. Generally, this type tends to feel imbalance in their body quite quickly because energy is moving so fast so they can sense things that are not right, but they also respond to treatment very quickly. But because they respond to treatment quickly, they think, oh, that's it, I'm fixed now. And they go back to all their bad habits. So again, it's kind of like metering that quality of uh, you're, you're giving them information, but at the same time, um, you've got to sort of get them, temper them in a way that they're not going to just go mad again, like drift back into their old habits again. Uh, generally, this type would need to be seen more often. Remember, they like to be seen and acknowledged, so you tend you maybe see them more regularly. Um, easily overwhelmed and avoid unrelated information. So you know, just keep it. There's no need to go into the nth degree. You give clear, concise details, but you don't need to go into anything that's like not connected with that. Keep it on track. Remember, this this type by nature will 
drift off and like to go and chase butterflies around the field. So try and keep it focused and on track, not, not get too lost in all that. Simple treatment plans, a big one. Don't give them huge amounts to do. Uh, regularity is the key as well. The more that they can be regimented in the lifestyle, the better that, you know, the more energy they're going to hold, the stronger they're going to feel, the quicker they'll recharge their batteries. They're not just going to be leaking energy all over the place. And these last two are quite important. Keep it fun. You know, this type, remember, this is the type, the natural connector. They like to bond with people and they like to sort of feel that there's a sort of great, everyone's enjoying it. We're all along for the ride. We're all having fun. So if you can keep it fun and you can keep it interesting, they'll be much more likely to follow what you're saying. And lots of rewards and treats, you know, sort of like, you know, say, so, oh, okay, you've been really good this week. You've like kind of stuck to this really rigorous routine, but let's say Fridays, you can let your hair down and go back to having a few things that you shouldn't do, something like that, just to balance it out. Otherwise, if it's not fun, they're going to quickly tire, loses interest quickly, and then they'll just move on to the next healer and see if they're going to offer them something more fun. Okay, uh, so again, we do the sort of 180. Uh, so it's kind of the opposite for this type. Um, they're very pragmatic and ordered, subconscious, self-centered. I don't mean sort of like self-centered mean, but self, they're kind of much more in themselves. They have, a, they have that strong mind quality because of the thinking analytical type. Um, they'll expect long-term results, okay? They'll probably have already read up on what you're going to do before you even do it. So expect that they're going to walk into the office knowing stuff. You know, this is a focused and practical type. They like to be heard, so you have to let them speak, even though it might drone on a little bit, sometimes excessively, but try and, you know, you just have to be worried that they like to tell you about what the problem is. And remember, they're visual as well. So they're going to be watching your actions and your expressions all the time. And they're going to be trying to preempt or know where you're already going with it. And that's just a natural quality of that type. You know, it's nothing good or bad. That's just how that type is. Uh, imbalances in their body tend to be felt more slowly. Why? Well, because they've got this density of tissue. So conditions tend to maybe be more chronic. They've gone on for a long, long time before they decided to do something about it. And similarly, it's the opposite to relieve them of that, responding much slower to treatment. So don't expect so much fast results. You know, it can take time. It's got to penetrate down. It's that sieve that's clog, clogged with stuff again. It takes time for to wash through and sift and, and try and remove all the blockages. Uh, needs to be seen with that frequency. Remember, they do quite well. Of, you know, they're, they're kind of more in their own mind, in their own thoughts. So they, you don't need to keep re reaffirming, you know, that I've gone away and remembered what you said. Uh, they thrive on more information, even if it's unrelated. So the more information, the better. If you feel you want to go into more detail, that's totally fine. Complex treatment plans, no problem. You can make it nice and complex. But flexibility, give them, remember, that this type is by nature too constrictive. So giving them a flexibility or choices is going to speed up the plan even more. You know, by giving them some flexibility, you could do this or you could do this. And they can remember all those different things and it gives them some flexibility. And ultimately, this type is moving towards the opposite, which is the uh, emotional type. So they need more flexibility in their life. Uh, keep it formal, but keep it informative. So, you know, you, you, you can kind of it's not so much it's not so much a fun thing. I mean, it's not that you can't have fun, but you, it's just it's keep it more formal and, and relaxed, but informative. So lots of information. We're following the plan. That, that's better. And they respond to any sign of acknowledgement or honoring them for you know their, their intellect or their mind or their knowledge. That's always good as well. So. OK, so those are the kind of primary things we'd be looking at um, with those two constitutions. Remember, we only talked about the constitutions here. That's the base constitutions. So I, what I've done is I've just shown you I've integrated uh, thinking and the uh, emotional together. So this is this is uh, two, obviously two pictures plopped together. It's just to say that the, the road to healing involves a mixture of expressing our inherent qualities and incorporating our opposites. So this system is based on opposites. So whatever. The opposite has got it's what you need to balance so if we're an emotional type if we integrate more of the thinking quality thinking analytical quality it benefits us and vice versa and like i said the two are automatically attracted to to each other as well so each has the other's answer if you like and it's like alchemy isn't it when you join the it's like taking two things and getting a third which is like a hybrid of the two and it's even better than the two collectively okay so let's have a quick look at some iris examples. There we go. 
Um, so from what we've already talked about tonight, so I've already given you the constitution. So quite clearly, we can see it's an emotional feeling. Why? Well, because it's got lots and lots of loose fiber. And we've got these big, see these big openings here. And when we, I mean, even in the physical model, but uh, even in the uh, behavioral model, we're really interested in obviously the types of shapes that these fibers make as well. So, you know, some of them can be very big, some can be kind of diamond shaped. Some have got pockets within pockets. Some are like joining together. You know, some of them look like leaves. Some of them don't. And some of them have got quite thick walls. Other than got thin walls. So all those things would tell us more about the way that the energy is being held in the in the body. So when we get these very small lacuna, these real tight pockets of energy, they become quite explosive. So what you can say is like that area of the eye becomes highly charged. So it becomes very, it will be triggered by something very specific. Whereas this big one here, it takes up so much space in the eye and it's so big. It's just kind of expansive and reactive and there's energy flowing all the time. Whereas this is going to be, when it discharges, it will be like a real bang. You know, you'll get a real like wild, a kind of explosive charge come out of it. So we're looking at all those qualities as well in the iris. It's, it's not just the... It really is holistic. We're looking at everything there. Okay. Uh, there's the opposite. You can see we've got lots and lots of color patches in this time. So this is definitely thinking analytical. Um, what have we got going on here? This is one of those ones. Remember I said you can have both in the same eye. So we've got some lacuna and Sora together here, but this is predominantly outweighed by the fact there are many, many Sora in here far more sore than lacuna and there's a kind of a tightness to the iris fiber as well a little bit wavy we would have to factor that in a little bit see how it darkens towards the edge as well this is where you're getting like a there's a little bit of shadowing natural shadowing in there and also diminution of uh, fiber or lessening of fiber at the edge so that would tend to slow things down a little bit more so there, we, there are lots and lots of things that we would read as well as like give us additional information. I mean, this kind of yellowing in here, there's like these uh, fatty deposits in here. Um, I mean, we can even go as far as looking at some of these uh, sort of blood vessels and things where they're kind of activating or pulling towards certain parts of the eye. I say there's, it's not just the iris, you can use the whole eye, but I mean, there's so much information in an iris generally, then, you know, it's more than enough for us to look at here. OK, so that's just to identify that was a thinking type. So lots and lots of colored patches, different colors as well. We'll look at for Sora. If they're very dark, the darker these get, then it becomes more like we, we see them as sort of more transgenerational. It's more like a past Then we would be looking, thinking more about ancestral stuff in the eye. It's like it's a, a, an echo coming back, like a return of something, a, a missed opportunity or something like that. If they get very orange and bright, it's like they're very immediate, they're highly intensive, really on the go, like gobbling up knowledge, just really sort of super, super energizing the uh, thinking quality, like making it sort of uh, overdrive thinking. Um, these other ones kind of mixed, you know, some of them are kind of big. They're actually the big ones, actually, we, we put less emphasis on big ones and small ones. So say that this colored area here, the fact that it's so bright and small and orange would be far more powerful than say something like this, which is quite large and a bit browny. Okay, so there's lots of things we can look at with Sora, the shapes, the definition. See, these are all very fluffy, these Sora as well. They've got no real hard edges to them. Possibly that one and that one have got a bit of an edge, but the rest of all kind of like stains, like, like superficial translucent. So again, we would read that in a certain way. Every Every... Everything would have a, a, a sort of an interpretation, but for our purposes, we're just looking at constitution. So we would know that that was thinking analytical. Okay, what have we got there? Primary constitution and emotional feeling. That's one, this is one of those ones where there aren't so many, um, there aren't so many uh, lacuna here. I mean, there's probably one decent one there. Guess that could just about be one, but I wouldn't really call it a lacuna. This is kind of like wavy fiber, but there's enough, um, there's enough going on here and there's a looseness to this iris that we would go emotional on this. Now, I know people are going to say, hang on a minute, what about all these colored spots? This is a different, we, we classify this as a type of ring when they collect, when you get these kind of peppery, rusty like patches that accumulate on this. This is the expression ring that goes around the eye. We get lots of patches on there. 
uh, that means something else. We're not interpreting a misora. So I, I said there are little caveats here. You, you've got to learn that. You just have to learn the, the way that you're going to interpret it. Um, but stripping away those little tiny colored spots there, I can see that there's a looseness to the fiber. We've got opening here, opening here and here, and I've got one lacuna. So it will qualify as a uh, emotional feeling type. But in regards to all that constitutional health stuff and the other stuff, you can see that there, there aren't many lacunas. So they'd be more inclined to that, but not so much so than say this type, which is, you know, got lots and lots of those pockets and lots of that activity going on. Okay, last one there, I think primary constitution. So thinking analytical, why? Well, because we've got more sore again, and these are quite orange. These are quite bright and orange. So these would be, this would really rev up that thinking analytical quality. They'd be like really hungry for knowledge, asking lots of questions on the go all the time, you know, going on and on sort of questioning, talking, trying to get to the bottom of things, very super energized. And the fact we've got these, um, we've got some openings in there as well. You see, this is one of those ones where you think, well, hang on a minute, I see a few lacuna in there. So is this an emotional type? This is where you'd have to learn the rules for how we balance it out. You know, and in this type, this has actually got more sore than lacuna. And there's a kind of a straightness to the fiber as well. Although I see uh, there is waviness, there's more straightness. So overall, we would lean this towards a thinking analytical type. And this is one of those ones where it gets close to the center where you're getting very close to the divide of, over which way it's going to go. So just a few little key things are tipping us towards thinking analytical and away from uh, emotional feeling. Uh, how are we doing for time, uh, Izzy? So we have five minutes. Oh. Um, so, oh. and um, Janie's got a couple of questions. So I don't know if you want, have you finished? Uh, I think that's it. It was just to say, so yeah, I've got, I just put a little thing about, about the course, but feel free to look at that in your, whenever you feel like looking at, that's just the kind of things that we cover in the course. That's the first part. So iris topography, which is one, what we've done tonight, the effects, which we didn't talk about for social types uh, the, about the fiber. So it's kind of like the basics of what you, all that you need to know to kind of get you going, but you can, you can study all that at your leisure. So um, shall, I, <laughs> shall I stop share or? Yeah, yeah, why not? Um, oh, no, keep it sharing, actually. So Because oh, okay. um, um, actually, I, I maybe with the questions. And also, I think, um, so I just wanted to say, um, just to remind everyone, there is a discount on the course. Um, it starts on Wednesday and, um, I'm just going to put discount code on the course in there because obviously, I mean, that was incredible amount of information that you've just shared in sort of, oh, that's it. Oh, sorry about that. Under I should, an hour. should have <laughs> stopped me if I was rattling on once you get going. No, in a good way, as in like, if you just imagine, you know, uh, five weeks of this, you'll be, uh, everyone on the <laughs> call will be, um, uh, flying through with, um, this knowledge. You so, got lots um, of notes. I mean, I've I, I got lots of notes. And you can study it. I mean, it's, it's kind of one of those things you just do at your own pace. You don't have to try and get it all down straight away. You can go back and watch the videos and rewatch the notes. In fact, I had a guy contact me a couple of days ago who did a course about a year ago with me. And he said, I never actually got around to watching the video. So he's only just gone back to stop and watch the videos now. So he um, just, it was enough to read the notes, you know. So I think there was plenty, plenty of info. Um, and the session, yes, the sessions okay. are recorded. You'll get access to them um, or you can join live. Um, that was to Rod's question, but um, just to go back, um, I don't know if you can see the chat, but Janie's asked, um, do the lacuna move from the inside outward? And if so, does this say anything? Uh, does it say again, does the lacuna move from the inside outwards? Let's find a picture of lacuna. Yeah. Okay. So do, what, what was the question? Do they move? Yes. Um, no, I mean, the structure in the iris is kind of my, I've, it used to be taught a long, long time ago that um, as your diet, lifestyle, and or even, you know, working through or processing your emotions, I suppose you could say, uh, the iris would kind of respond to that. Like it was read more like a dashboard on a car. So it's like a constant readout of what's happening. But I think pretty much everyone's ditched that idea now. There are still a few schools that promote that. I mean, I fall into the camp of the iris uh, the iris does change, but in subtle ways. So what I would say is that you can add to the iris over time. Color can be added. 
But structurally, structurally, I'd never seen any difference. I've been photographing eyes for over 20 years. I've got many eyes I've taken, retaken and retaken. And what you'll see over time is that the eye, there's a kind of natural aging process. You kind of lose a little bit of opacity in it as the colors subtly change. You can see how this one's got some yellowish that's that's kind of started to overlay. So obviously when they were younger, this would be much much brighter and bluer. And then over time, it's got more pigment overlay. These pigment patches, these Sora, tend to start forming around the age of four and kind of finish up around the age of 12. Um, but that's not always like that. I mean, they have seen them form as late as 50. Uh, and if they do, they tend to be the darker ones. Um, but, you know, there's a kind of ongoing process in as much as we're layering down color and also injury to the eye. Like you could think about it as bruising. So I've had cases where uh, an eye has been injured. So something has kind of hit the cornea like a piece of hot dust or something, you know, or a hot spark hit it. And then the the area directly below it has begun to discolor like a bruise beginning to appear and like a yellow a yellowness so even though it's not actually touching the iris as a kind of reaction between the iris surface and and uh, you know the kind of cornea or the coverings of the iris as well so it's highly sensitive obviously it's like it's taking in light all the time isn't it and impressions everything's coming through the eye so um generally this structure doesn't change in fact all of this is pretty much formed before you're born so this is why we really kind of say lacuna and the actual iris structure are the sort of transgenerational components and the Sora kind of like adaptive components, things that have been added or have come later on to show perhaps a change or a movement in a different direction or unless they're dark, which is then we kind of look at them more as kind of uh, ancestral again. But no, to answer the question, no, they, they don't change. The iris is pretty much fixed. Obviously, Remember, the eye's dynamic. It is dilating and contracting all the time. So it can give the effect that they're moving in and out. But uh, generally, the, 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 the structure is fixed. Um, and I guess just to follow up on Jane's third question. So just to clarify, your constitution is set and wouldn't change then? Uh, no, because you could be born, um, let's say you could be born with a um, with this emotional uh, type here. But let's say you developed literally hundreds of these color patches over time, then that would shift you to the uh, to the opposite. So as you're growing and you're maturing, you know, you're coming through that the formative years, they start forming around four years and then that could change the constitution. So the constitution isn't, that's less likely to happen in something like this because you've got literally so many of lacuna here. It would, have, it would take a lot of Sora to throw this in the other, other direction. It would be unlikely that this would ever, ever have been a thinking type. However, if you look at, say, this iris before four, all of these colored spots would, and I say four is a kind of a, a, a mark. It's not, it's not held to that. You know, you could develop them at two or it could be at six or it might be at 15 but generally we we see them start to appear around the age of four and they seem to sort of lessen after 12 but not you know that's not a, a given but this would have been a very blue iris we have lost all this yellow and this yellow coloration and all these sora would be gone so if we removed all the the, the color patches from here we'd be left with some small lacunas so this would have been an emotional type by constitution and um, so just, I think this uh, helps with the next question. Would the Sora take um, prescience over the lacuna? Uh, they've got more weight, because if you think about it, they're condensed, aren't they? They're, they're, they're pockets, they're sort of, uh, sort of, not pockets, sorry, they're like intense uh, pigments, like sort of just patches of solidness. They're kind of constricting and pulling energy in and slowing down. So what we tend to say is when we're counting, for every uh, for every one Sora, we really want to see sort of two lacuna really to balance it because their force is very very strong. However, you've got to take every every pair of eyes as an individual, and you've got to assess. There are lots of other things that we can assess with. So, you know, I'm giving you the sort of the basic tools of identification, but that doesn't mean to say you can just go, oh, it's like this, or it's like that. There are the sort of tips and tricks that you use to make a final analysis. So it's it's like a you're weighing up all the all the factors and then you're coming to a conclusion. Um, and if I was got a question, um, to whom would you advise behavior iridology? Um, parents, business companies? Is, I think this is, how would you use it in practice? Or how would you use it? Yeah. Well, lots of different, so the simplest one is just basically if you're dealing with patients, so people coming in, you've got all that information now just by, a, just by determining their constitution without knowing anything else about them. 
just looking at the sort of the uh, resiliency of the eye, you know, their ability to heal, um, you know, and which constitution you're dealing with. Is it some sort of thinking person or is it some sort of analytical person? Okay. Uh, sorry, thinking or feeling type. So you can determine just that by uh, a quick look of the eye. So that could be really useful, you know, how to communicate with them, how to deal, what kind of therapies are going to be working better for them or their communication skills for them. So that's all great. Um, the, the next level would be the social, say like the social types. We didn't even talk about that, but there are four, they sort of, the two become four and they fall out into these four social types. And each one of these types would be suited to certain kind of um, undertakings or, you know, business or uh, interactions, social interactions. So they kind of give us a clue about how, you know, who would be good to put in, uh, like the technical department, who would be good to put in the sales department, who would be good to... Now, it's not to say that you can't put anybody anywhere, but it can show you that there's already a propensity towards that and they would excel in that because they have all the right skills for that kind of thing. So, you know, is this somebody that's, that's going to like to stand over a bench laboring and machining metal all day and getting it absolutely perfect? Or is this somebody that's just going to be more conceptual, you know, thinking with a drawing board, would that work, would this work? You know what I mean? Or somebody that actually would be presenting it to the world and, you know, packaging or somebody actually going out and selling it. So that's it's useful from that point of view um, for just personal interactions. It's useful to determine, you know, uh, the polarities for a relationship attraction. You know, what, what, why are some people attracted to other uh, people? I mean, specifically, the more opposite they go, the stronger the attraction. So if you've got a wild, raging, emotional type and you've got a super analytical thinking type, they, the attraction is going to be very, very strong between those two. And if they have iris positions that are the same as well, it shows that there's a kind of a, you know, if particularly if they're opposite iris, iris positions, then they're kind of really learning their, their opposite lessons. And those relationships can be quite challenging. They can be really full on. So, um, you know, that can be useful as well. So if you're using it for like counseling or relationship, uh, any kind of relationship industry or, you know, matching people. I know this has tried to be used as a, I think Jim was looking at doing it was a dating or part of a dating service or something like that. But it is fun. I mean, and, and that is a big one as well. Above all, this is fun. It's a, it's a, it's a nice way to understand, um, you know, how people, how, how it kind of, how it all works, you know, how it all kind of interacts and connects. And it's just great for self-analysis as well, looking in to see what's pushing your buttons and what really gets you excited about things and what things really terrify you. And, and you can see all that kind of quality as well. And ancestral stuff, your parents, you're looking at your children's eyes, you know, even though their constitutions may be borderline and may flip, but that's, that's less, you know, that's less, that's less likely. So for, uh education would be really useful you know which children are going to excel at more creative things which ones are going to be more the kind of uh the number crunchers you know all those kind of things are, are good as well and then just yeah just a, it's just a fun tool it's, it's a really fun tool and i think just leading on to ros's point um you know is can you does it mirror the sort of myers-briggs Jungian types um well, the, the constitutional, those yeah, yeah. four uh, social type. I mean, yeah, I mean, all of those socials, all, all of those systems are, yeah, I mean, they, they're all, there's a crossover between all of them. I mean, you could almost, you could say it's like earth, fire, air and water or whatever, yeah. you know, they're, they're all, you'll find a way to correlate them. But we break them down into those four because it's a nice, convenient way to think about their energetics. But remember, you are more than your iris structure. This is like your pre-pro, uh, your pre-installed software that you come with. If you choose not to run on that software, it's totally fine. But your natural inclination is, is to run on that way. That's kind of like how you're hardwired. But if you want to break the patterning and move beyond all that, that's totally fine. You know, and, and integrating your opposite will help you to get the benefits. It's like thinking people have emotions and emotional people think. It's not, it's not like if I'm emotional, I can't think anymore. It's just that we're more weighted towards one side or the other. So by bringing integration, you get the best of both worlds. Um, will you be sharing these slides? Sorry? Will you be sharing the slides? Just oh, I don't know. What do you think? I'll ask you <laughs> should we share them? I think, should we I think... clean and not let anybody have any of them? Well, yeah, I think <laughs> everyone, everyone will get the 
recording and genuine is Andrew's slides for the course are incredible. So I would just say everyone should sign up and then you'll get all of these plus way more. I would say look, I mean look, look, I don't know who's in the audience now. I don't know who's what who's watching it, but I I guess look, I would say, yeah, I'm just please don't sort of just give them away or or I mean I'm quite happy for people to use it and promote it and I'll support you if you want to do that. But just, you know, please obviously don't use it for um something else, you know. Don't, don't just post it all over the internet or it's, it's nicer if people get invited and get a, a feel for what's going on and then get interested in the system. I rather that people that found it were going to use it and get more interested in it rather than just putting it out there as, you know, whatever and just uploading it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so also Tina's asked, do you ever see both emotional and analytical within the same eye or do you either get one or the other? Uh, only one. You can only be of one constitution. You'll either be of some type of thinking type or some type of emotional structure. That's it. Um, but obviously your opposite will integrate and balance. So you're always trying to integrate the qualities of the opposite. However, I say every now and then you will come across one eye that will be very, very hard to type. There'll just be so many uh, contradictory things there that it could lead you one way or the other. And I've literally had or seen a few people where you could tell them they were thinking type and they would agree. You could tell them they were emotional type and they'd agree. And that's where you've got so close to the point where they cross or they drop on one side of the fence it literally is on the fence almost. It's not going to be. They're always going to be one or the other, but it's going to be down to your skills as an interpreter to decide which way they're going. But, you know, that's unusual. Um, and oh, where's that question gone? Ah, yes. In behavioural iridology, does the sclera play a role? Uh, it does. We'll use it, um, particularly in brown eyes. It can be useful when you get those... Um, uh, you get those kind of pig, uh, brown pigmentations that actually form close to the drainage channel around the outside. Usually when they start forming bars, it can be indicators. If you think about it, once we've left the iris, we've left the, we think of the iris as the body that's sort of floating in the white. The white is like the external world. So once we're into the sclera, where the energy changes, it's like it's picking up vibrations that have come off the iris and gone into the white of the eye, if you like. But it's it's a different it's a different field of activity, although it has some bearing on one another. You can't use it as as exclusively or as uh, accurately as if, if it's in the in the sclera. But we will look at some stuff in there. You know, those uh, you know those kind of brown pigmentations. Um, if the capillaries are kind of in there, is, there are a few capillaries that we use, like forked and uh, serpentine and things like that. But you know that that's a kind of an ad. Again, that would be like a a modifier it would be something in there that would be of extra interest but we wouldn't base a constitutional analysis on it um oh lynn hi lynn she's an alchemist as well <laughs> um do does long or short-sightedness flatness of cornea etc play a role in the constitution uh that's not something we would be really looking at no Okay, um, so Barbie has asked, one, um, oh, one or Sora stronger than several? Um, I think that's two point. Um, is one Sora stronger than several? Is that oh, one. Um, we kind of rate them all on. So if I was looking at this, let, let's look at this example here. If I was looking at this one, so the ones that would interest me would be this one here with the arrow and this little one down here. Um, this would interest me because it's very bright and orange and it's also sitting right on the edge of this lacuna. So what I've got is I've got two opposite charges together. So that's like a sort of a dynamite and a fuse. So that would be pretty powerful. And that would be, that would, that's, a, that's a key point of, a point of interest. And this one here, again, because it's close into the mental area, it's got, it's, as we move into, there's lots of different zones in the iris, but this is like the mental zone. It's very orangey. Um, and it's in quite a strong area. It's like the heart area as well uh, of the iris. So it's kind of like a, a, an intra or outer heart area. It would be of interest as well. I'd probably focus on those two. But that's something you just learn to identify. Of course, everything means something, but I wouldn't go into the nth degree and start describing every single thing in this eye. You know, but we got one here, we got one here, we got. I mean, they're all interesting, but they're all telling you the same thing. This is a thinking type. So unless you specifically want to go into one area of their life and talk about it more, but these two of all of them shine to me, they kind of shine out and uh, uh, asking to be talked about more. So these are things that I would focus more in on. 
Um, Nadia has asked, okay, the dark brown Sora in the outer circle, was it ancestral, but not in the ancestral area? How can you use that? What does it tell you? Uh, if you've got dark brown sore, particularly when they move into this outer third of the iris, it's all about blocking. So that's like we call them resentment sore. They have their own interpretation. So that can be things that have gone on between like father and son, mother and daughter, like ongoing issues where it's like it's sabotage. You know, I'm not going to I'm not going to say no, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> And, and the square or more blocky they are, the more that that energy pervades. So that would be a transgenerational trans -gener trait because it was dark, but it, we'd also read it as some type of Sora and it was, a, and it was having a blocking effect. Mm -hmm. So yes, I mean, things that go on inside the, and I don't want people to think, oh, it's, you know, just because it's the ancestral area, you can start reading about every type of grandparent and stuff like that you can see influences we divide the eye up into certain sectors and we assign certain lines in the family to those areas but it's it gets more like guesswork it's kind of questioning you could just see the qualities or the or the energetic that's that somebody is calling or somebody is making a noise or somebody's having an influence over something and of course that's going to then affect an organ or an emotion you know that's occupying that part of the eye as well that's so cool. I love that. Um, uh, Janie's has also asked, can you recommend any books for further education? Um, I think any books on iridology are quite good to read. There's lots and lots out there. Um, just look at the age of them, because obviously the older ones, like I say, some of the older ones focus a lot on this idea of the dashboard of the eye. You know, if you start drinking orange juice every day, then you'll turn a brown eye back into a blue eye and stuff like that. So just be slightly wary of that. But they have st still got some good information in them and they can give you good uh, I just teach you about looking at the eye and traits, various traits that you'd be looking at. In terms of um, the behavioural stuff, I mean, my, I've got a book I'm writing at the moment, which will be out probably next year. I've just, I was going to self-publish it, but I've had a publisher approach me and ask me to do it with them. So, so that's kind of changed the game now. So now I've got to do it all really properly and cross the T's and dot the I. So it's going to take a little bit longer, but that should be finished by the end of the year. So that'll be out. Um, and if you can still get a copy, a copy, copy of Jim's book, J, uh, James Ver Jim Verges. Uh, his book is just behavioral iridology. I, I sort of uh, helped him write, or not helped him with that book yeah, about uh, 2008, 2007, I think it came out. So you might still be able to get a copy of that. It's, it's kind of, it's quite basic. It's like a hundred pages with a lot of color pictures in. But that's a good general one just to sort of get going on. Um, there's the Red book, which is still probably available if you go to the Red website. I think you can sign up for it and get a free copy as a PDF, but obviously you're going to give them your, your contact details. Um, I've just been slightly cautious of the Red because, I mean, it's it's amazing. And the guy who came up with it, it's amazing. But um, it it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit confusing. I think there are things in there that are um, uh, will actually be, be, be better off not knowing. <laughs> it would confuse you more. They They... That one, that particular system uses a four type system and then it gets more confusing. Um, I would say, look, if it's free, it wouldn't do any harm to download it and read it and see how you get on with it. It was written a long time ago. It's like 1979. It's a little bit out there, um, you know, a bit, bit slightly cosmic. Um, but if you can kind of rattle through it, there's good information in there still. I wouldn't, I wouldn't not read it. But other than that, put a link to your course again. Okay. <laughs> um, I've just put a link to your course again to say that um, because obviously um what Andrew has is the, the five-week course, which will cover all the foundations. So going to a lot more depth than we've done tonight. But then you also, once you've done that, there is an intermediate and an advanced course, which basically will take you through everything that you need to know about behavioral urology. So yeah, I have to yeah, I try to I try to break it down to three parts. So you've got like a beginners intermediary and advanced so yeah i mean otherwise you just don't want to get it's a lot of information and you it's better just to go through it a step at a time and you know that this is the primary stuff we've covered tonight basic constitution this should be the, the very sort of ground level of the course because identifying thinking and uh, feeling is like the beginning of everything once we've got that down everything else is a logical progression
Um, and oh, where are the questions? Okay. Oh, Ivana said that was really nice. You answered my question to understand species perfectly. Thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah. Karina says, absolutely amazing information. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. And Tina said, thank you. Um, Jamie's got another question. Do you hold an iridology session online? Uh, a few of the students from the last or the course before had asked to, they said that they wanted to start getting pictures together and maybe we could do a um, like sessions where people could bring irises and we could just talk about them. So I said, yeah, that, that maybe could work. Um, I think the thing with that is the problem is good pictures. You need, you can see this is the kind of image I'm used to working with. So you need quite good detail. Um, if we could get, yeah, I mean, maybe for the future, if people can get some good images together. Oh, I forgot to say there's the Iridology Forum. If you join my Behavioural Iridology Forum on Facebook, that's free to join. Um, I quite often post a lot of stuff in there and talk about them. Some of them are quite lengthy. So that's a free thing you can join, have a look through, see if it interests you. And just in case Janie's question was about the actual consultation, um, what would you do if you've got a patient that wants iridology done um, and it's online? What would you recommend for them to do to get a good picture? Oh, um, there is an app. Somebody sent me a link for it. I can't remember what it was called. Um, there is an app that you can download, which actually takes a fairly decent picture. It's not, it's not like anything like this, but... It's kind of good enough to get a basic idea of what's going on. So that's one of those ones where you download it, take the picture, but you don't send it off because if you send it off, you have to join and then pay money. But I think if you take the picture and then uh, just grab the grab, grab the screen, uh, it works. It's actually quite good. Um, again, I, I can't remember the name of the software, but if you go on my forum, I yeah, put the thing I was going to say, I was just going to, I just found the link to your forum and then I went in it and it's called I cause i cause selfie is it i can't remember i just tried it a couple of times i thought actually it's not bad it's um, and i've just posted ah here we go yolanda i cause i selfie and i've just posted a link to the uh facebook forum in the chat if anyone um, wants to join okay. that yeah and then you got then you got these kind of chinese gadgets you know like they're sort of video cameras that you, you cup over the eye they, they take reasonable pictures i mean the big thing is photographs isn't it getting a good getting a good picture so actually, this leads on quite well to Sam's question about what what era dis what thing do you use to recommend to take pictures? Uh, well, I do, yeah, this is just an SLR. Uh, well, I say just an SLR. It's a quite an expensive one, a reasonable mid-range SLR, you know, like a four or five hundred pound camera. Um, the lens is a uh, one hundred five macro. I got a Sigma, I think, to do this, and, and then the, the clever bit is on the end. It's a, like a cone with a with optical cable so it can project the flash down then you get a nice flat because in behavior we're kind of interested in a nice flat image whereas physical sometimes they like to side light to, to get more definition on the eye but um you know obviously you're talking a bit of money for that as it gets expensive <clears throat> so um i would just say until you're kind of ready to take that step it might be better just to buy one of the sort of cheaper cameras one of those you know hundred pound Chinese ones just to sort of take images and start getting used to it. And if you feel it's something you want to expand and spend more time with, you could go out and buy a proper iris camera. I think if you go to um, uh, Miles Research, the company's called Mike, the guy's called John Miles. It's John, uh, Miles Research is the company. He's a kind of specialist for building and custom building, and he does a huge range of cameras. So, you know, if you speak to John, um, he, he's got lots on offer. I mean, maybe he might have stuff in, he could actually custom build or modify, or if you've got this, he could make that for you. I mean, he's, he's pretty good with his hands, so you can pretty much make anything. So that's something else you could look at. Um, I just spend the money on it because I enjoy it, and it's something I don't, you know, I enjoy looking at and working with. So for me, it was worth it. But until you're sure it's what you want to do, I wouldn't go spending huge amounts of money on cameras. Amazing. So I'm... Um... We've obviously overrun, but I wanted to make sure everyone got the questions answered. So thank you, Andrew, so much for your time with that. I think that has, yeah, I think we've covered all the questions. Um, so um, I'm assuming everyone, yeah, no more questions. So this is good. So, <laughs> no, sorry, I've been, uh, more questions than Marriott, but um, I appreciate everyone have got evenings um, to go to. So um, thank you so, so much, Andrew, for all your time and wisdom and all this incredible information you've put in for us um which is just 
mind blowing. Um, and I, for one, really, really excited to learn more. Um, so um, everyone that does want to learn more, you know, obviously, um, oh, Esther said she uses the Dynalite Aeroscope. Um, that's Dynalite. Yeah. Uh, is that one of those? Yeah, it might be one of those. Is it one of those sort of like a video camera that sort of cups on? Oh, I know the Dynalite the, is like a, as a, like a microscope, isn't it? Like a, a yeah, it's a USB microscope. I think. Um, uh, oh, I don't know. Um, so, so basically, I am. Um, uh, yeah, I did. That just leaves me to say thank you, everyone, so much for joining. Um, Andrew, how can people? So, people, we've got the links to the forum. Um, uh, I'll send everyone the links to the course. Um, yeah, there's, and there's the contact information there. So I've got Facebook for behavioral iridology. There's an Instagram page, behavior, although the Instagram one, I don't tend to put any text on it now. I just post the picture and then say, go visit Facebook and read on it. Um, and there's my website, behavioriridology.com. Don't forget to put the U in it if you're from the States. Uh, behavioral iridology at gmail.com to contact. And I think that's as much as I can think to take. Perfect. Um, well, I think that's really, really helpful for everyone that's joined. So um, thank you again. And um, yeah, and uh, everyone stay in touch. And just to let you know, from the AMH perspective, we do have a course on CBD starting tomorrow as well. Um, but I will get the recording out to everyone um, probably in the next couple of days. And um, thank you all so much for joining and take care. Thank you.